Thank you so much, Layla. Well, to all of you, thank you for joining us today. You know, I take great pride uh, in this committee. There's wonderful committee members on here. Um, and we just, we just, I love them. And our board members, you see a lot of our board members as well. So thank you very much. This is my favorite session that what we're going to do today. Um, and you guys, thank you again to our amazing speakers. But this event would not be possible without our sponsors, of course, and we'll give them knowledge and credit at the end. But I call her the amazing Amanda. Uh, she is so incredible. So it's the amazing Amanda Brummett and the Brummett group. Her team is amazing. And they put this all together and they make it possible and it just gets bigger and better every year. So. I'm going to turn this over to the amazing Amanda and her team. Thanks. Yes. You're muted. You so go. much for the space bar. I'll have to work on that one. <laughs> I was just saying um, thank you, Tony. And um, some of my team members are here as well. Leanne Liu and Melissa Smith. And it is absolutely a team effort. So um, thank you to everybody. So um, we have four of the most amazing women in Capel that are gonna speak to you today. And they all are worthy of a 30 minute introduction easily and have more collective degrees than I have fingers to count. So Michelle Dillman is gonna drop full intros in the um, chat for you guys. And then just really quickly, I'll tell you just a touch about them so that you've got um, a little bit of a frame of reference on who they are if you don't already know them. Um, so Amy Goddard is a physical therapist and owns Go Sports Medicine here in Coppell. Susan Harris, who I haven't seen hop on yet, um, but I'm sure that she will, is a functional medicine provider at Lifestream Health Center and Med Spa here in Coppell. Dr. Divya Javaji is an internist and geriatrician here in Coppell at Prime MD Geriatrics. And Dr. Angela Moameka is a pediatrician at Mark 9 Pedi Pediatrics. So, um, they are here for all the Q&A that you ladies have for them today. I do want to give the one disclaimer, the healthcare operations person in me can't help but tell you this. Anything that they share today should not be construed as medical advice, just general overall information. If you've got specific questions for medical advice, please talk to your own doctor um, or schedule an appointment with one of them and, and do it face-to-face -face in, um, in that setting. So with that, I am going to dive into the questions. and. Um, for this particular question, I'd love for all four of you to answer it if you don't mind. Um, as I've gotten to know all four of you, you, you really look like you do it all, both personally and professionally. And so I'm really curious if you can share for us, um, what do you do to keep, keep up your busy, busy work and life schedule, but also stay really healthy? Because I know you all really put health first. So if you can share with the audience some of your tips and particularly tricks, we want to know the easy stuff. We would love that. Don't be shy. Unmute and jump in. Well, um, I guess I guess I'll go first. Um, and it's hard to kind of coordinate this in Zoom. Um, but uh, I think work and life balance is just something that I learn like daily. <laughs> it always changes. It's something that worked yesterday does not work today because especially being in medicine, um, things change constantly and you're always reinventing the wheel. But um, I think adaptability is key and just kind of rolling with the punches is the best way to go. Um, especially when I have a toddler and a, a baby at home and then a new practice and it's just juggling all of that is, um, I've not perfected it by any means. And I feel like, I guess, rolling with the punches is the best way to go <laughs> about it. But um, I guess it's nice because after a stressful day at work, you go home to the kids and then they kind of take your mind completely off of everything and it makes it easier. That's awesome. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Javaji. Um, Amy or Dr. Momeka, do you want to jump in? I'll jump in here. Hi, everyone. Andrew Moameka with Mark 9 Pediatrics. Um, so this is, this is one of those challenging things, I think, for everyone pre and during pandemic is how do you balance 
everything that you need to do. And a friend of mine said, you can do everything, but not at once. <laughs> right? So we can't do it all at once. And one of the things I share with, with colleagues, with friends is just give yourself the grace of the next moment. And I think I shared with, this with Amanda when she stopped in the office a few months ago, that's what I do for myself. Okay. So this, I might not have made the greatest choice in terms of a meal for lunch. I might not have made the greatest choice in terms of the tone I used when my son did something I wasn't so excited about, but I have the grace of the next time, right? The next moment to just make a very different choice, make that the healthy choice. Um, and also just give yourself time to be imperfect. It's okay to sleep in for an extra 30 minutes. It's okay to only take a 10 minute walk instead of your normal 30 minute walk. It's okay to just get outside in the middle of the workday and just get some fresh air. If that's all you do for exercise, that's enough exercise for your mind to get you on the right step. So just even the literalest, the smallest things that you can do that are specifically to help you be healthier mentally, physically, spiritually, do it. It doesn't matter if it's five minutes. Like I say to my new moms, I say, get your solid five minute nap. <laughs> I know it doesn't seem like a lot, but get it because it helps. Even the smallest thing helps. So grace of the next moment and every little bit, bit helps. That is so true. And because my 18 year old daughter's on here, I just want to make sure Madison, did you hear Dr. Moameka be forgiving to your mom when she doesn't talk nicely all the time? <laughs> Amy, do you want to go next? And I know you guys, I kid around all the time that Amy's like physical medicine meets Brene Brown, but she really is. So, um, so do you have some Brene Brown for us on this one, oh, Amy? Wow. Um, no, I, I love what um, Dr. Romeka and um, Dr. Duvali just said. I, um, I, you know, it's, it's hard um, sometimes. And I, this whole idea behind, behind pre- um, pre-pandemic and post-pandemic, you know, it's a, it's a fluctuating situation. And so I really appreciate that idea of um, self-grace. Um, that's gone a long way for me this, this time too. I think one of the things for me um, that I realized a few years ago, and I think I've said this before, is um, what is so important to me is movement. Um, and, I, and so I know my body feels better um, with movement. And so um, I think finding what, finding that, that thing for you that, that makes you feel good. Um, and so for me, it was three simple things. It was movement, music, and, fit, and um, uh, sunshine. And so just fi finding those simple little things in your life that you can sprinkle in. Um, and just like Dr. Momeka said, you know, if you don't have time for your 30 minute walk, Go for your five-minute walk. Just sprinkle sprinkle those things in, um, and um, so that's been that's been helpful to me um, as as far as trying to be trying to feel healthy um, through these times. That is super helpful. Thank you, Amy. And the amazing Susan Harris has joined us. Hey, Susan. There. We were. Just just talking about um, how all four of you look like you do it all, both personally and professionally. And I didn't mention this in the intro, but Susan has four kids that somehow manages all of that. So um, we'd love to know, Susan, what is, what is your trick for putting your health first while you're still doing all of that? Well, especially with 2020, it's definitely been a challenge for all of us. Um, you know, I think just taking one day at a time and, tackling the task at hand that day, especially with kids at home and patient craziness and staff craziness. You know, everybody has a different hot sports opinion about everything and just trying to be open to others' opinions, I think has been a big challenge this year. Um, even my kids, you know, they all have different opinions, but I think that has helped me because I, I have to be open to everyone else's thoughts. And so as a patient, you know, as a mom, um, it's really, it's really been a challenging year, to be honest. That it has, that it has. Thank you, Susan. So um, you guys can all drop questions in the chat. Uh, feel free to throw it in there to everyone, or if you don't want um, your name attached to it, just DM it straight to me and I, I won't tell anybody. And I'll even um, tell Alex if he needs to close his ears. 
Um, so our next question, and I, um, I think this one is especially important coming from all of you as clinicians, is in this strange world now where most people are working from home, what do you all do when you get home to, to turn it off and to leave work at home? How do you, how do, you do that? What are, what are your strategies there? And uh, to any four of you, whichever, or all of you. That's a, that's a, a hard one, um, especially being a small business owner, um, because um, as small business owners, you, it's never, you're never done, right? Um, and so there's always something that you could be working on, something you could be doing. Um, and so for me, I've had to learn over the years that, um, to, that I can let it go. It might, I might not get it done that day. It's going to be there tomorrow. Um, and, you know, it used to make me very nervous to, to do that. I always was one of those people that had a list and I had to get it done. But, um, I, I feel like, you know, I've learned that, and especially this year, um, has, I've just, you know, learned to kind of go with the flow a little bit more, um, that it's, it's, you know, it, if it doesn't get done, it, it will eventually get done somehow. And, um, and so being okay, trying to teach myself to be okay, to, you know, um, just let it go and, and know that, know that it will eventually get done what it needs to get done. One thing that I've tried to do, cause I feel like I can't turn my brain off when I have all those lists of things floating through my head. So I just make notes on my phone, like, okay, what do I need to do tomorrow? You know, here's the punch list. And then that way I feel like I can at least somehow turn it off if it's in a note, because then I know I'm not going to forget it because I wrote it down. So I just keep a little note in my, I've got 20 jillion notes in my phone, but it helps me to be able to turn it off. Think about other things. So I, I started using this app called GCAST and it is possibly my favorite thing in the world. Um, basically it prioritizes and it's similar to what you just said, Susan, it allows you a place where you can put down day to day what you need to do. And I follow the, the theory of everything can be put into three buckets. There's the needs to be done right now. There's the delegate bucket. So someone needs to do it, but does it have to be me? And then there's the eventually will be done, but it's not urgent. So putting them into those buckets helps me. And then putting them in GTAP says, okay, this is going to be delegated. So tomorrow I will tell so-and-so that they need to do this. Next week, when I have more time, I will do this one that is not urgent. And I need, I know I need two hours of time to do it. So I'm going to block out two hours of my schedule to get this done next week. But I fully agree. Once you put it down and you put that plan down, it does allow you to just take it out of your head. So it's something I've gotten into the habit of doing at the end of my work day to just make sure I have my plan and that I'm going through my list throughout the day and actually doing the things on my list first. That's probably the biggest challenge is you create, have this great list. You get to work, some emergency happens, and then you ignore the list <laughs> and you start dealing with the emergency. So when you get home, you can't really put your mind at rest because you're still like, oh my gosh, all this stuff I needed to do. So really making sure you put that list front of mind, print it out, put it in front of you, whatever it needs to be so that you can go through us throughout the day and then focus your time on people who need you as well, right? So we just talked about being able to um, stay healthy during the pandemic. And one of those ways that we stay healthy is that we connect with the people we love. We connect with people who care about us. We connect with the people who pour love into us. And that's how we feel rejuvenated and ready for the next day. So give yourself that space, even if it's an hour to watch a show. I watch the most, the oddest shows with my 15 year old son, <laughs> but it's just, it's not even about the show. It's about just finding out why, why he likes it. Let's talk about this a little bit, this anime that we're watching right now. But it gives me a break from my world and a connection with him that helps to regenerate me. So I, I really love the, the, the idea of list and I fully agree, write it down, put it on paper. Love Dr. Momeka, is that G tasks, tasks for Google? The app? She's muted. She's muted. Can you hear me now? So yes, it is. It's the G task for Google. It's a green check mark. 
it's great. And I, um, the other part of it is at the bottom, if you scroll to the bottom, it tells you how many tasks you've completed. And I've been, I started using it before I opened my practice and I'm almost at a thousand tasks completed. <laughs> so it gives you that, like, okay, there is a reason that I've been so busy and exhausted. <laughs> I've been doing a lot of things. I put the link to the app in this chat. Yeah, oh, I love that. I, I need to check things off the box and that is going to make me feel very accomplished. So thank you. This is so nice. Okay. I feel like I'm a new person to this, um, to this whole new small business and, and getting advice from um, the more seasoned ones. I'm like, wow, I definitely need to like, you know, take that all in every little bit that you know, each one of you said, I'm like, that is so true. That is true. And it is, it's so overwhelming. You go home and you're like, I want to do it all. And I feel like those emergencies, especially being in the medical field, you're like, those emergencies keep coming and you don't know when to stop because emergencies won't stop. And, um, and setting that priority is super important. And I, and I'm definitely learning. It's definitely a work in progress for me. And I would try that D task. Um, I guess that that's, a really good a suggestion because I'm like sitting in bed trying to think about what I have and I'm like oh my god now it's 12 and the baby's gonna get up soon and that gives me anxiety and I'm like well you know just hearing a little tidbits from everyone is just is, is really nice and um, for me I think it's just you know you have to kind of see what you're capable of biting off more than you can chew has always been a, a thing that I needed to like step back from. But um, even as a small business owner, you get so many opportunities. And, and I feel like, especially when you're new, you wanna take them all and do them all. And, and then really putting the brakes on what you can do and what you can't do is really important because, I mean, there's a lot of great opportunities that are presented to you, uh, you know, especially when you have your own business. And, uh, and I feel like for me, the biggest challenge was really kind of picking and being like, okay, I can, I can definitely give quality over quantity at this point. And uh, that was my, I guess that's what was my driving force. Cause you know, when you take the quality out of, of things that you are striving for, I guess that puts me in, um, puts me in a dilemma because I'm like, okay, now I'm like sacrificing the quality and now I'm just doing it for you know, the sake of doing it. But uh, I guess um, when you really think about just adding the quality aspect back to it, it automatically prioritizes it in my head. And I'm like, okay, you know what, this, this is where I can give myself 100% and I can take on that task. And I guess that's my priority list in my head, but jotting it down is a great, great <laughs> um, advice that I, I'm definitely gonna take with me. I feel like we're all gonna have lists this afternoon. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Dr. Javaji, while you're on there, um, we actually had a question come in for you that I'd love for you to address and the other panelists as well, if you'd like, um, was specifically about skipping screenings and checkups and um, the person expressed just concern about disease getting missed. So um, what do you recommend for our group and what are you doing with your patients to make sure that they, um, that they don't miss out on important things like that and ultimately land in your office later with disease that's further along? So yes, screening is super important. And um, I feel like uh, I'm bad about it because I'm like, okay, let me just send my labs in and I can look into it. But it's something that uh, it is something that we have to actively do. Screening can pick up a lot of things and can catch them early. And I've, I'm very happy when I do catch things early because it doesn't always present um, with, with a full blown manifestation. Um, and like one of my patients I had, uh, he had no signs of like, he had no signs of cancer. And I'm not trying to be like the scary person that's talking about cancer, but um, no signs, but just one little lab was off. And, and it, it was enough for me to be like, okay, that everything makes sense, but that just doesn't fit in the puzzle. So we like probed a little deeper and then it was just the beginnings of it and it was easily treatable and we caught it early. And it was one of those moments when I'm like, as a doctor, I'm like, wow, like, prevention is so key. And we're, we're trained to pick up on every little, like um, every little thing that's out of place. And so when you do come to these checkups and if there's something slightly off, we'll definitely do our due diligence to make sure that we, you know, we investigate further on why this is off. And 
sometimes it's when the whole picture's messed up and you're like, okay, I don't know where to start. And I don't like it when I see that side too, uh, at that end of the spectrum. But, you know, it's, it's always good to be like, okay, I am maintaining my um, uh, visits. So with my elderly, I like to do, if you're 65 and above, I like to do it six months um, just to keep it kind of regular every six months, um, just to kind of keep tabs on you and just, you know, things are going well, let's keep it that way. We don't have to necessarily do labs, but just blood pressure, you know, if there's changes, um, we do that too. But now um, I got this really cool thing for my um, practice now for people that have high blood pressure and obviously they can't keep coming in. I don't want them to keep coming in. Um, we have uh, something called remote patient monitoring where uh, they're given a little kit um, to monitor their blood pressure. And every time they take it, I get, um, uh, I get their results and it kind of keeps track. So that is great for my people that have um, high blood pressure. That way I change their medication sooner and not later. And you know, when we go back and have a discussion, they're like, okay, you're ranging in the 140s now. So um, I can up your medication a little just to, you know, see that. And then when they take it in the morning, if it's dipping too low, I'm like, okay, just try that medication at night. So it gives me a lot of information. And especially now in the 20th century with the technology that we have, it's just a lot that we can do to take care of ourselves. And um, I'm just happy to be part of it. And yeah, trying to put new things into my practice is something that I'm uh, really trying to do for my patients. Yeah, and since we have several different specialties um, represented, a question came in specific on, you know, Dr. Javaji, for your adults, what screenings do you look for and what do you want them to have? But I'd love to hear from all of our specialties on um, screenings that you recommend. We do, uh, as a physical therapist, um, we screen for red flags. So if you have uh, a patient that comes in, uh, Sometimes, uh, you know, musculoskeletal pain can not be musculoskeletal pain. And so we're, we're trained to look for those red flags. So if you have, for example, just one little thing, um, if you have pain that um, is not mechanical for like, if you cannot find a position of comfort, if it's unrelenting and you cannot turn it off, there's no position where, where it can turn off. And then especially if you start to put any kind of previous history of cancer or what have you, you put that all together, um, use these um, clusters of information. And then if you get a red flag, um, then, you know, you're like, this, this doesn't seem mechanical to mean it to me. Maybe, you know, maybe you need to go get this ruled out or checked out. So we use red flags. So we screen for that on all of our patients that come in. To me, doing a, primarily a lot of women's health is, you know, mammograms, pap smears, all those things are very important. But what I find more important than any of those things is just doing your own uh, self-breast exams every month because, you know, you may not come in and get a well woman exam every year or every two or three years, but you have your breasts with you every day. So knowing what's normal for you, uh, that way you're the first line of detection. If something abnormal pops up, you know, obviously you'd want to go get that checked out. I think that's really the most important screening that you can do as far as the girl stuff goes. So um, for, for pediatrics, as uh, I'm sure the, the national news has reported, for those who don't know, there's been a significant drop in well child visits and immunizations since the pandemic started. Um, and what I'm noticing in my practice is an increase in obesity and an increase in developmental delays. Um, so I have patients who gained 30 pounds um, since schools closed in December, uh, which is shocking. If you think of a 12, 13 year old that's gained 13 pounds, 30 pounds um, and developmental delays because these are kids who are interacting with other family members, with other children, really learning through community that are now mainly isolated. And oftentimes they're isolated with parents who are busy working, rightfully so. Um, so they're not getting the interactions that they used to. Um, so for me, what I've used, similar to Dr. Devaji, is, is, is to really focus on um, telemedicine. So I use telemedicine for well child visits um, and also for just routine screening on children who might have behavioral issues, who may have depression, anxiety, attention deficit, 
whose learning issues are making virtual schooling um, challenging for them um, and whose behavioral issues are also making virtual schooling challenging for them. They are not getting the same support that they were getting, whether it was preschool or in the school setting. And now it's a challenge because we're suddenly expecting to duplicate what a diagnostician would do in school, what a, a PhD level trained um, expert would do. And that's not a realistic expectation of a parent. Um, so more of my screening is picking up those kids, picking up the kids who are mainly having challenges in school, challenges with schoolwork, challenges at home, and being able to link them to the appropriate specialists that can do teletherapy, tele telehealth, um, and also being able to bring them in appropriately. So they may not need to come in for a 30, 45 minute well visit in the office. We can do most of it virtually and then come in just for a vision screen or hearing screen immunizations and then they're gone. Um, we also do what I call drive-by shots. <laughs> so I encourage families to take advantage of that. So if you're really concerned about having your child in the office around other kids, around other people, then finishing as much Boldly, and then coming in in your car, we give you the immunizations, you head out. Um, so as much of that as we can do to really encourage families to come out, to, to get the kids the, what they need that's necessary for them, and also to be able to connect with those families. Um, the final piece of it, which often goes missed when you think of a well child visit, is we're not just assessing the child, we're assessing the family unit. Um, and Luckily, we haven't seen a rise in child abuse, but this is one of the concerns that I think schools had and certainly pediatricians had was that we would see a rise in child abuse because there's no longer an outside party who can observe that, that child family dyad, who can observe that child to say something doesn't feel right. And it's similar to picking up an early cancer. You just get a sense that there's something off about this family, the way they're interacting with each other, the things they're saying to the child, the way they respond to positive things that you're saying about the child um, that then triggers you to say, this is a family who I need to look into a little bit more. Um, so again, telehealth offers me that ability and actually ends up giving me an additional piece because now I'm seeing them in their most comfortable zone um, and I'm getting to see some of those things that you may not see in the office. So it's been, it's, the pandemic has been a, a hit or miss for some things, um, but I would say absolutely screening, screening, screening at all points. Um, in pediatrics, that is our bread and butter because we are trying to make sure we don't end up with adults who have these very concerning chronic illnesses. And the way to do that is to get them identified early and get it managed early while they're still very plastic and very moldable. And I don't want to say fixable, but treatable um, before it becomes something more concerning. I really like how in, in everything that you all are talking about, um, it sounds like you're all screening for things that, that don't actually um, feed your own practices, that you care enough about your patients, that you're, you're actually taking the time to, um, to focus on things that are, that are obviously good for them, but that um, you'll eventually send them somewhere else. And that just um, really speaks volumes about, about your hearts and how much you guys care for your patients. Um, so I think a lot of people, we all, you know, people complain because it's late or, um, you know, costs money, this, that, and the other. And it just, um, it's a nice reminder that you guys do a ton of work that is just out of the goodness of your heart. So thank you for that. Um, we had a question come in about nutrition, um, what you all do in your personal lives and in your families um, related to nutrition and specifically anything you do to make it easy. And um, Dr. Momeka, you mentioned the, the weight gain and um, we've actually done a talk um, with uh, the Capel Chamber about the COVID-19 pounds, not the virus. So um, if you could also share um, within the nutrition realm about um, helping us maintain a healthy weight, that would be awesome. Absolutely. So I will say, um, I guess, separated from what I'm saying to my patients versus home. So it's the same, but I'll talk about them differently. So for home, for myself, I have started bringing lunch in. <laughs> so I always bring my lunch and I try to encourage everyone to do the same thing. Make your lunch, bring your lunch. So don't bring lunch that's like McDonald's, obviously. That's not the same, but make your own lunch the night before and bring your lunch in is probably is one of the simplest ways you can at least have one healthy meal, right? And that lunch should have the basic three, I call them. So fruits and vegetables, whole grains, protein. Um, so whatever your protein choice is, whatever your whole grain choice is, whatever your fruit vegetable choice is, 
make sure you have those healthy three, those wholesome three in your lunch, and then you're good to go. Um, Stay hydrated, drink water throughout the day. Water beats coffee or other caffeine sources any day. There's no part of the human body that's coffee. (laughs) So make sure you're drinking your water throughout the day. Um, For my patients, because it's a pediatric age group, I approach it a little bit differently. Um, I want to make sure that they don't take this as a diet because it's not. I want to focus it as as a a healthy lifestyle and a lifestyle change that they're going to live with throughout their lives. So the conversation I have with patients is about their hobbies. What do you love to do? Are you a gamer? Do you like to be on on your your video console all day long? Do you like sports? Whatever it is you have as a hobby, that's how I build out what may be an active life for you. Um, So if you are a gamer, there are games that are more active games. There are certainly other ways to play a game versus just sitting in a game chair, right? So you can stand, you can take breaks. And I encourage this a lot with my teens who are gamers. And I say, okay, for every hour that you're on the video game, you should spend 30 minutes helping your parents do something. Do the laundry, do the dishes, um, help sweep something, vacuum, whatever. So make that contract with mom and dad that for every hour, I'm going to give you 30 minutes of chores. And those, the 30 minutes not only helps your brain because you step away from the game, but it also helps your body because you're moving and you're helping your parents and learning responsibility while you're doing it. So stay, find something within your realm of excitement, things that excite you and use that to build an active lifestyle. And on the food aspect most of the time, snacks are the main thing, especially now the kids are home. I'm finding it's not the meals that they're eating. It's the snacks that are leading to weight gain. A patient who gained 30 pounds, it was because he used to have, or she used, sorry, she used to have after school a snack that was a glass of milk and a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. So she'd have half a sandwich and a glass of milk. Now that she's home, she decided that she's now going to add Hershey's chocolate milk, chocolate syrup into the milk. And she's going to have two or three sandwiches each time she has it. So she'll have three snacks throughout the day, two or three peanut butter jelly sandwiches, and who knows how much (laughs) chocolate syrup in that milk. So what started as a healthy snack now became this thing that was just filling up her days, right? So again, it's about moving back to healthy snacking, um, getting them back to what they were having before, and then replacing that snack with what they really are hungry for. And typically, kids are bored. That's what that's the reason why they're snacking so much. So find things that are going to get them excited. Again, I go back to hobbies and say, well, go for a walk, ride your bike, take the dog out for a walk, go to the park, do something else, because you're not hungry, you're bored. Um, And make sure that that snack time is as scheduled as possible so that you have this scheduled routine of breakfast, morning snacks, lunch, afternoon snacks, dinner, and then some water before you go to bed. Um, But keeping a a set schedule also helps them to say, you know what, I just had breakfast. My snack is in until 11. I'm going to go ahead and do something else until it's time for a snack. And when it's time for a snack, I'm going to eat that healthy snack. Uh, But that's how I approach kids so that it's more about just their lives and less about, oh, I really have to focus in and count my calories and do this and that. I don't want them to get to that level as much as I don't want them to have an unhealthy body. So it's really healthy lifestyles and promoting healthy lifestyles. One thing I will add to that that I do with my own kids is just making a healthy smoothie. It's amazing what you can pack into a smoothie that if you don't let them know it's there, they will never know that you've added a little bit of spinach to all of that. Um, Another thing we do at our house is a lot of crock pot stuff. You know, you can start that ahead of time and cook extra for the week. I think just having a game plan and being prepared, whether you meal prep for the whole week. um, And especially this time of year, there's a lot of great healthy crock pot, Instapot recipes that you can just throw in there and it's done when you get home. Um, The other thing too, I think is a rotisserie chicken. It's amazing what you can do with the rotisserie chicken. So we always buy two rotisserie chickens at Costco and you can create all kinds of interesting things. Quick, easy, simple, just using a rotisserie chicken. Um, And then there's a ton of mail order kind of meal prep helper things. Some that um, comes in a kit that just gives you the recipe and all the ingredients and you just throw it together. But even if you don't want to cook, you can pick up, um, like there's one in Flower Mountain called True Fit Foods. It's just healthy. They have vegetarian options. 
it's about 10 to 12 dollars a meal which you can't really even go to chick-fil-a and get you know a meal for that price uh, and there's another one online, I think called Freshly, that is a frozen, but it's made with really healthy, you know, paleo, gluten-free, but it's taste um, like it would be bad. Like, for example, there was one that was like a fried chicken and macaroni and cheese, but it was actually like cauliflower macaroni and cheese. But my teenagers were actually eating my food. So, you know, to me, if the teenagers eat it, you know that it's pretty good because they're like, can we get some more of that? I'm like, that's my food. But uh, so there are a lot of options, even if you don't have time to cook or meal prep. There's a ton out there if you just Google. Um, I mean, I can think of 10 to 12 off the top of my head that are super easy and mom helpers for sure. Yeah, I worked with a nutritionist about 20 years ago and it was life changing. Um, and a couple of things that I learned from her that's kind of stuck with me that is helpful is this idea of um, if you're if you're starting to make a commitment towards healthy eating, um, the first thing you have to do is purge all the crap out of your cabinets because if it's there, you're gonna eat it. Um, so purging is the first P. And then the second P is um, shopping the perimeter. So if you go to the grocery store, um, shop the perimeter. So it's your meats, your vegetables, um, and try to stay away from the aisles, which are all processed carbs. Um, and so that's just kind of a general rule that I use. Um, and then the, um, uh, the idea of eating when you're calm. And so there's a psychological component to eating as well. So you don't want to, if sometimes I'll catch myself just, I'm at my desk and I've, I've, you know, I've only got a few minutes to eat and I'm just shoving food down my mouth. And it's like, okay, stop, calm down. Um, and try to try to carve out, um, you know, 20 minutes or so where you're going to sit down and and um, eat calmly um, and slowly, which is the the next P, which is um, portion control. So this idea behind chewing your food. So if you chew your food 25 times, try to chew your food 25 times before you swallow. Um, and it's hard to do, but what happens is it makes you slow down and then you're full before you finish your portion. And, and for me, it just slowly started to happen where I didn't finish, I, I had stuff left on my plate because I was full. Um, and slowly my portion size got kind of right size because I was slowing down, I was chewing my food. So just a real simple thing of trying to chew, chew my food 25 times before I swallow. Um, was helpful. And then water. Um, so water, 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 water is so important. Um, and you know, I, the, what I tell people is half your body weight in ounces of water per day. So whatever you weigh, half of that in ounces per day, plus what you sweat out. Um, so if you go for a hard workout and you sweat a lot, um, or if it's a, if it's the middle of the summer here, it's hard to stay hydrated in Texas in the middle of the summer. Um, and so a lot of extra water. Um, and so, yeah, the, the P's, the, the, the five P's have been helpful for me, just some general rules. I completely agree with the water thing. I can't stress that enough. I feel like I'm the water Nazi when people come in and um, they're like, can you give me a pill? And I'm like, no, I'll give you water. And then they look at me very disappointed and then not only do I tell them to drink water, I take away what they love, which, which is coffee, carbonated drinks, their sodas. And I'm like, you know, I learned, I tell them that I learned the hard way as a resident. Um, when you're in the medical field, you're running on coffee. You're always running on coffee. You're fueled by coffee. And then so um, when we, when, when I learned, I think in the last year of my internal medicine um, residency that for every cup of coffee that you drink, your body gets rid of three cups of water. And I, that definitely made a lot of sense to me after why I was crashing so hard because I was running and fueling myself with coffee. But, um, but yeah, so it gets rid of three cups of water and your body's forever catching up. And the same goes with like highly sugar drinks like sodas, because it's just, we all know our kidneys, they pull, they, they're diuretics, they pull, um, sugar goes with water. So they, you're peeing it out. And then 
yes, it's liquid, but it's a, it's not, it's not water. Your body can't do much with that liquid. In fact, it's pulling more water with it. So um, it, it's a very like, uh, it, it's something that we don't take into consideration because I see a lot of my elderly patients come in and I do their blood work and it's just so dehydrated. I'm like, my goodness, it's just like thick paste. It's not blood anymore. It's just thick paste. And like, do you, are you not drinking water? And they're like, yes, but I'm drinking my coffee. And then I have a little bit of diet, like, you know, Dr. Pepper. And I'm like, that is not water. <laughs> and, um, and then it also helps with you know, just our constipation issues and everything too. And it's just a lot of things that we struggle with, and especially with the inactivity that we're, that's happening with the pandemic, that you don't move around as much, and then you don't realize that, that you're going to get constipated when you're not moving, and and you're not drinking enough water to move things around. So you're just it's it's just a whole vicious cycle. Um, and so I've coming uh, I've come up with like little things that you can do and try to substitute slowly just. You can add a little bit of electrolyte powder or something to your water if you can't really, you know, handle the water. But uh, I'm just like, really try substituting it because you trust me, you'll thank me. And I'm like, if you think I'm harassing you, just imagine being married to me. Uh, now my husband walks around with a huge jug of water because uh, I definitely harassed him for the longest time. I'm like, trust me, you'll feel better. You'll feel better. And now his body is so used to drinking that much water that without his like quota for the day, he can't handle it. Um, and then another thing, uh, a tidbit is fruits and certain foods that are really good for constipation. Um, I'm just, I guess I'm just, uh, focusing on constipation more because I see that a lot with my patients and, and all of you have touched all the good nutrients and balanced way to eat. And, but I feel like constipation is such an issue that it shows up in the elderly that I really feel like I can, you know, help out eating green pears works really well. Raspberries have, for the little raspberry, the amount of fiber that's packed in a raspberry is exponential. So yes, we all know prunes and prune juice and stuff like that though, but you'll be amazed at what oatmeal can do, what green pears can do, what little raspberries can do, and then throw in some water and you're golden. And if you really need the big guns, then you can go for the all brand cereal, which I guess I did when I was pregnant because uh, you know, your uh, pregnancy is just one of those wonderful things you're blessed with and you, you get that, but all brand cereal used to definitely take care of the trick without any medication supplements because medication supplements, you got to remember when you take them, they pull the water with it. And if you have nothing in you, then, um, you got nothing to push out. So, uh, definitely. Yeah. I can't, if, if there's one thing that I would stress, it, it's the water. <laughs> And, and I, I love what you said. I love that you're focusing on, on the gut um, because uh, gut health is so important. Um, and um, gut health is mental health, actually. There's more serotonin in your mm -hmm. gut than in your brain. Um, and when we, when we don't eat healthy, when we eat all those processed carbs, it all just sits in our gut and putrefies. Um, that's why we have gas, um, is that's putrefied food sitting in our gut. Um, and then if, if you can't get rid of it, um, it is just sitting there. It's like a landfill um, and it disrupts the, your intestinal flora and, um, and just, you know, I, that, I love that you're concentrating on that because it's so important, but a lot of people don't like to talk about it, um, but it's so important. Adding some probiotics into your diet helps too. And um, especially if you are in an antibiotic, throw in a probiotic with it just to help your gut kind of maintain that normal balance too, because you're killing off the good bacteria when you take those antibiotics too. So, you know, yeah. just in general, just make sure you, those two things go hand in hand. Yes, you can take your antibiotic, but throw in a probiotic in there just to put the good bacteria back because the antibiotic doesn't choose what bacteria it kills, it kills everything. So, um, you want to put the good ones back in that, that are helping you with what you're talking about, that landfill that's sitting in your stomach. Yeah. One thing I- Probiotics. I, Go ahead, Susan. One thing too, I, you know, I think meeting people where you're at. If you are a Starbucks person and you've got to have your Starbucks every day, well, there, look for alternatives. You know, do you have the caffeine or do more of a keto coffee with MCT oil? You know, even just little subtle changes slowly to progress to no coffee. 
I think is very important. I mean, if you look at the Starbucks ingredients, I mean, some of that stuff has so many calories and so much sugar. It's just crazy. But there are some really good alternatives like dandelion tea. Um, I put collagen, MCT oil, different things into my coffee. So at least, you know, half caffeine, different things like that to change it up a little bit where it's not as bad. There's always a place and you have to kind of meet people where you're at to be successful. So probiotics is a beautiful segue into supplements and nutraceuticals. Um, this is actually a question that was last, left over from the last time we did this and it didn't get answered. So I wanted to bring it back to you all this year, which is when it comes to supplements, which ones do you take? Which ones do you recommend to your patients and which ones are garbage um, and anything in between? We'd love to know that. And specifically on um, the probiotics, is there a certain one that you all recommend or that you don't? To me, supplements are very interesting because um, I mean, we do a lot of functional testing because we do primarily functional medicine. So, you know, looking at if you're not getting results with a certain probiotic, you can actually do a functional poop test. Send a kit home with a the patient, they poop in the little nacho tray and they send it to the lab. And it actually tells you what you're missing. Do you have microorganisms that are pathogenic? We all have bugs in us, but it's when those bugs become pathogenic and start causing disease and gut dysfunction. So to me, it, there's not really a one size fits all for every patient because everyone's biochemistry, genetics, everything's so different. So I think it's important to know what your individual needs are. You know, vitamin D, vitamin C, zinc, all those things are big hot topics right now. And I, I do think they're all important and I try to take a lot of them, but I mean, I see some patients that have great vitamin D levels and I see others that it's like 10. So everybody's different. So I think knowing your own individual healthcare risks and then optimizing that based on your individual needs. Uh, the other thing too, I see patients who like, well, I'm taking vitamin D and I'm taking B12, but their labs don't show that. You know, not all supplements are created equal. You know, Walmart, Costco, there may be things that work for some individuals, but they aren't working for you according to your labs. So you know, I think just knowing what that is and using a good quality uh, supplement, I think is important as well. So Susan, you, you make a point that is probably my driving point to people is supplements are not FDA approved. Um, what's on the label doesn't mean what you're going to absorb, right? So, or what you're going to get. And I always stress the fact that it's a thousand times better to eat your minerals and vegetables than to get them from a pill. That is where you need to get them from. So your pharmacy with a PH should be a pharmacy with an S, right? So you should really be thinking about the foods that give you, are, that are naturally rich in those nutrients that don't only give you the energy you need, right? In terms of just calories, but also give you the macronutrients and the micronutrients that you need. So if you are thinking about vitamin D, how about fatty fish <laughs> that gives you not just vitamin D, but also great omega-3, omega-6 fatty acids, right? So it's that, that, combination of the macro micronutrients within foods is the way our bodies are naturally ready to receive a lot of those nutrients. So focusing for me in my practice, I focus people away from supplements and into their diet. Let's talk about what you eat every day before you start supplementing yourself with a pill. Let's talk about what things you're eating that may not have the right vitamins and minerals that you may think are healthy, but are actually not. Let's teach you about reading nutrition labels. Do you understand what a nutrition label is, what it's actually telling you, what a serving size is, what that serving size then translates to the percent of vitamins and minerals that you're getting from that food. So getting people excited about in the wintertime, citrus fruits, strawberries, berries in general, nice fatty fish, great whole grains, not processed grains, but oatmeal, brown rice, quinoa, great whole grains that are going to give you what your body is asking for in that season. That's really what I want people to focus in on. Um, and of course, water, right? So drinking water throughout the day, I think it's been stated, it cannot be overstated. Um, and I think Amy started to talk about your body weight in, in kilograms, take that in ounces of water. And that is absolutely the advice. If you're working with a nutritionist or dietitian, that's the first thing they're going to say is 
you're not drinking enough water. You think you are, but you're not. And whenever I do that calculation with the kids in my practice, they're always like, oh my gosh, that's how much water I have to drink. And yes, that is how much water you have to drink. And however you're getting that water into your system, I'm okay with sparkling water. I'm okay with infusions. Just get water, not processed water, but get water, right? And get it into your system. But yes, please, please, please eat your vitamins and minerals. If, if that is my, my mainstay that I talk to families about because I can't, I can't tell them that their 10 milligrams of whatever vitamin that they're getting in a pill is actually 10 milligrams going into their system. I can't. Um, what I can tell them, though, is that they're eating the right foods. They are going to be getting the right nutrients into their system. Yeah, and I, I love that you bring it back to, to food. Um, I, I juice. And so, cause, um, that's just an easy way for me to get, um, a, a variety of fruits and vegetables. So juicing is a really nice way to, um, to get that, that variety that you're talking about to try to get our micronutrients. Um, so I, that's one of the things I find helpful. Amy, are there any supplements that you like for bone and muscle health? Or foods? You know, I, I'm, I don't know that I can speak to supplements. Um, I, I'm probably going to defer to the, to the medical docs on that one. Um, but I, I do know, I do know my body likes sunshine. It likes vitamin D. Um, the more I get of that, the better I am. And so I, knowing that like in the, in the summer, I can get a ton of it like naturally by being outdoors. Um, but so in the winter, I'll supplement with, with some vitamin D um, supplements myself. I don't know if that's right or wrong. The medical doctors can jump in on that. Um, so, but yeah, I'll let them speak to that. No, but um, getting vitamin D through sunlight uh, varies with skin color. Um, so if for, for someone like me, who's of Indian descent and we have darker skin tone, we it, it doesn't make sense. We're in the hottest place in the world, but we our vitamin D levels are all low across the board because we don't absorb vitamin D that well. And um, so, you know, a, for us, we might need the supplementation a little more there, even though we're in the sun all day, it's not helpful sunlight. And you only get vitamin D in a certain portion of the day, not, not throughout, you know, the entire day, just because it's sunny outside, you're not getting the vitamin D. It's usually the early morning sun where you're getting the most vitamin D from and um, just before uh, we get off the topic of supplements, I, I get this question a lot about um, since I am in the geriatric field uh, about supplements for memory and supplements for you know there's there's a lot of markets out there for supplements for focusing supplements for memory and and I tell them I'm like it this is not um, that's that's a shortcut that's like that, that's a shortcut. It's like taking a weight loss pill uh, and the, and, but not exercising. That's basically what these memory pills are. Um, they, they just put um, a bandaid over the bigger problem and it supplements, especially when it comes to memory, there's no such thing. There's nothing on the market that can actually boost your memory. It, it's just probably keeping you a little active and you feel like you're able to focus a little more, but um, you know how they say Prevagen and all that other stuff that's tooting around saying that it, it can do wonders to your memory. It doesn't. The best thing you could do for yourself is actually being a kid again and learning new things. And you realize kids don't get dementia because they're forever learning. They're forever learning new things. Um, they're, and they're building those bridges in their brain where um, they're not, uh, they're, they have enough. And so if you do have Alzheimer's in your family or you have um, any, uh, if you have any like memory cognitive impairments in your family, you can actually beat the odds with that by just learning new things and, um, you know, taking on an instrument. If you've never played an instrument in your life or learning a new language, your brain physically builds a new bridge and a new neural pathway that, um, that gives you more of a network to fall back on. So you, your safety net is a lot bigger. And even if you are, um, you know, susceptible to these uh, cognitive impairment uh, things, you have such a network to fall back on that the, the symptoms never manifest. And so it is a very preventable thing. And another thing um, with the memory, uh, it, I, get, I just got asked this yesterday, 
Um, the number one thing is you wanna make sure you get your hearing checked too, because if your hearing is off, um, it can put you at risk for Alzheimer's. And so if you're, if, you're no, if you're not fixing your hearing, your brain is going to shut off that network slowly and it puts you at, at a higher risk for developing Alzheimer's and all that. So you wanna take care of the preventable things before you supplement with something else because otherwise you're just throwing water at a wall and it's not really fixing anything because you're not addressing the problem. And so that's just my complete tangent on supplements. <laughs> Did we get the probiotic brand name? Did I miss that? That anybody likes? I since I'm uh, I do Nature's Bounty. Uh, it for people that need a full blown probiotics and Nature's Bounty, the Costco brand actually. Um, there's one that's Ultra Strength. That so with probiotics, you you want to make sure that there's a different number of strains in there, and also the number. The higher the number, like the count. So they go anywhere from 2 billion to 20 billion um, of the active um, cultures in there. And the more the strains, the higher the number, the stronger the probiotic. So, you know, depending on you be the judge, if you were on antibiotics for a while and you need a stronger probiotic, go for the one with the most strains and the highest number. And that, that's kind of how you choose and weed out uh, things and follow the brand um, and follow the instructions on the bottle because every probiotic is manufactured differently. And some say take it on an empty stomach, some say take it with food. So you wanna make sure you follow that just so you, the probiotic that you're taking is um, you know, working as it should. And I, I do a, a kombucha, um, a probiotic tea. Um, and um, I like the, the, the ones that have the ginger in it. Uh, the ginger is just kind of a, a stimulant to me. And, and so sometimes instead of a cup of coffee, I'll do my kombucha with a little bit of ginger and that gives me that, that boost um, that, you know, just kind of wakes me up and gets me going. It's, it's kind of an acquired taste, the kombucha, but um, <laughs> full of probiotics. So um, years ago when I was in, res in pediatric residency, one of the pharmacists said, you want to make sure that probiotics are refrigerated. They give you more potent active life cultures if they're refrigerated. And health food stores is usually what I, when, whenever families are interested in probiotics, I will send them to a health food store um, and have them ask for the probiotics there. Um, for a, a general not truly being concerned, so you of course want to separate it to someone who truly needs probiotics because you're concerned about GI motility issues, GI function issues, in which case, yes, I'm going to say, let's go to the health food store, let's get a refrigerated pro probiotic, let's make sure it has some key um, pathogens, not pathogens, some key um, bacteria in there that are known to help with gut motility, that are known to help with decrease reflux, decrease some of the issues that your child or you are having. Um, for the general public that are taking probiotics as general health, then yes, things over the counter are fine. You can buy them online. I am a huge fan of floor store kids um, because of course I'm in pediatrics and floor store has over now 17, 18 years of using it has never, you know, had an issue. I've never had an issue with it. Whenever I send kids home with antibiotics, I love that Dr. Javadji used to mention that. I send them home with specific antibiotics that I know are going to affect GI function. Mm -hmm. I tell the parents to do one of two things, either start floor store kids or yogurt. I am such a yogurt fan. The minute babies can eat solid foods, I say, get some yogurt. Greek yogurt, plain yogurt, not flavored yogurt. So get plain yogurt and blend in your fruit. So if your baby is going to have applesauce, have a tablespoon of plain yogurt, a tablespoon of applesauce, have a little peanut butter there because we know that we want to expose them early to those allergens and feed that to your baby because yogurt continues to be a really good source of some good active cultures. Um, so again, if there's a specific concern, yes, I'm going to use refrigerated cultures, but otherwise for the general public, go with what makes the most sense for you in terms of price range and in terms of accessibility, of course. And I, I think the, uh, the, the um, yogurt, the, the plain yogurt, um, that's something that you can put in like a smoothie too, um, or I, I use kefir, which is like a, a liquid yogurt, or um, that's a nice thing to put into your, uh, to your smoothies as well. 
get some probiotics. Susan, do you have a favorite probiotic? Tony oh, says you have some. To target the probiotic based on the issue. I mean, there's some for girl issues, bladder, your, your no genital issues down in the girl area uh, that have different strains. So I really think it depends on that individual patient issue. Uh, the other thing too, that we've had a lot of great feedback from patients is using like fermented foods. I think Sprouts has a brand called Bubby Sauerkraut that supposedly is really yummy. Um, and just having a tiny bit of that, you could probably even mix that into a smoothie to get that extra, you know, healthy probiotic kind of food from the fer fermentation. The Bubby's pickles are really good too. And they're apparently fermented as well. Yeah, I'm try the pickles, but. Yeah. Well, we've had several COVID questions come through and um, Tammy, thank you for a segue between nutrition and COVID and um, inflammation. So um, her question is that COVID has obviously caused a lot of stress as well as a lot of other stressors this year. How does that affect internal inflammation and what foods are good to help prevent it? Obviously in our functional medicine world, we truly do think stress is a big trigger, um, whether it's trauma, drama, or just everyday worrying. Um, you know, looking at, I do think we tend to eat more junk when we are stressed. So knowing if you've got food sensitivities, eliminating, you know, gluten, dairy, sugar, all of those inflammatory foods. I tell our patients, anything that's white probably doesn't have a lot of nutrients in it. You know, so you're better to eat berries than a banana or things like that. Uh, so just make the smarter choices because we're all stressed and we all, you know, deal with that differently. Um, I'm going to, I don't know how I post this. I'm going to post this. Under, I found this little quote by Corey Ten Boom. I don't know. Are you, do you post that Amanda or how does that get? Cause it says private, but anyway, oh, uh, I'll, I'll read I'll it. Really it. I just, I found this very interesting, especially Okay, I'll read it to you guys, but um, it just hit in my heart just this week, just reading through different things with everything going on and when is this madness going to end? Um, worrying is carrying two days at once. It is moving into tomorrow ahead of time. Worrying doesn't empty today of its sorrow. It empties today of its strength. You know, so even our kids, I mean, my kids are doing virtual school next week because they're doing star testing. So they've had to disperse the other kids not doing testing home. And it's like, I didn't even know that was happening. So it's just every day is something different. And, you know, our poor teachers, like how they're navigating this world and the stress and the changes that they're having to accommodate. And then the kids are, they don't know even what's happening next week. So I think just trying to focus on today, like we're going to get through today. We don't have enough strength to carry two days at a time. We'll worry about tomorrow, tomorrow. So I just found that very enlightening for sure. Yeah. And I, um, I, I have seen stress come out, um, more this year in my patients than ever, um, come out as, you know, it, it's embodied and it comes out as musculoskeletal pain, right? It's headaches, it's neck pain, it's back pain. It's, um, and so, um, you know, you, you, there's a, you know, we all get stressed and then our, our physiology reacts to that. And um, so I, I saw an interesting quote the other day that it said that 80% um, uh, of office workers some, uh, suffer from something called continuous partial attention. It's um, called email apnea. It actually has a name. It's being studied at the National Institutes of Health. And it's this idea of, you know, we write something down, we check our email, we check our Twitter, um, we're in this perpetual state of kind of distraction. And that actually causes us to start to breathe very shallow. Um, and then when we breathe shallow, we breathe off too much carbon dioxide. And then um, that, actually, that actually makes us have more air hunger. Um, it's, and it's, it's the carbon dioxide levels in our, in our body that um, tells the hemoglobin whether or not to release the oxygen. So we breathe air into our lungs and the, um, the, 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 you know, it gets attached to the hemoglobin and the hemoglobin um, 
in response to the carbon dioxide levels will decrease that into our into our tissue. So, and so I'm, I'm linking this back to our shallow breathing and stress. So when we get stressed, we begin to we begin to breathe more shallow. And so one of the things that I've I've, I've started incorporating breathing um, and just the awareness of our breath and how it can affect affect our physiology and this idea of um, you know being tuned into your breath. So when you start to catch yourself in that in that shallow breathing pattern, um, I always just say think about um, slowing down your exhale. Um, and we know that so a lot of people when you hear when you hear someone say that, um, oh, if you're stressed, take a deep breath. Well, a lot of us, you'll see a lot of people go and they'll, they'll take a big deep breath in um, and they'll focus on the inhale. The inhale is actually sympathetic nervous system. That's your fight, flight, or flee. That, that's, your, that's what you're in when you, when you have a lot of anxiety. If you can slow down your exhale and focus on the exhale, the exhale is parasympathetic. And so this idea of, um, Yes, take a deep breath, but when you when you breathe in, think about a feather underneath your nose, and you want to breathe through your nose. Um, and the feather, the feather breathing, will actually stimulate your diaphragm. So instead of trying to trying to breathe in with your chest and your and your neck um, and your shoulders, it actually uh, by breathing through the nose and stimulating a feather. Um, it, you only get what you need and it actually stimulates your diaphragm for that breath to come from down low. So, th so you do the feather breath in and then when you exhale, think about slowing down that slow, sweet part of the, the beginning of the exhale. And what that does, when you, when you slow down your breath rate, your carbon dioxide levels actually increase again. We do, we have a program, we have a breathworks program where we can actually measure that. So you, we'll put a nasal cannula on you and we can show you how when you're, 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 you're in a state of perpetual hyperventilation um, where you have low carbon dioxide and, you, and you, then you breathe, your body thinks you need more air, so you breathe faster, it's this negative feedback loop. Um, and so this, this idea of slowing down your exhale and when you slow that down, carbon dioxide levels go back up and then your whole system becomes parasympathetic. And so um, I started incorporating more of that kind of work in with my patients when I, when I perceive that there's an anxiety component to, to their pain. Um, you know, the autonomic nervous system, I always like to say, runs the show. And um, the, the beauty of the breath is, just by telling my patients, the beauty of the breath is it's free and it's always with you. And it's very powerful. Um, and if you can slow, if you can slow your breath and slow your breathing, then you're you're not you're in your parasympathetic nervous system. So when you're in your sympathetic nervous system, fight, fight, or flee, you're in your reptilian brain. And so it's a it's a quick feedback loop, right? It's meant for survival. So that's when you fly off the handle and you you say the wrong things and you act the wrong way. Um, versus when you can slow your breath and be, get into your parasympathetic nervous system, there's a, now you're in your, your frontal lobe, which is a, it's a longer feedback loop. And now there's power in that pause. Now you can respond in that pause. You know, you can decide now how you're going to respond. Am I going to respond out of kindness and compassion and empathy? Um, and there, it's so powerful. Um, and it's, it's free and it's, and you have it with you all the time. Um, so, uh, you know, the anxiety, I always thought anxiety played a role in, in what I was treating all day long, but this year has really, really brought it out and it's really, um, really made us focus on it more. So Amy, I guess what you're telling me is that when my Apple Watch nudges me to breathe, I need to quit dismissing it? Yeah, uh, yeah, actually, or just here's what I would say is just become, a, become aware of your breath. Awareness is that first step. Um, it just check in with your breath. Um, and when you catch yourself, when you're just taking these short breaths and you, you know, and I get like that and it's, and we, 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 
you know, it's, it's this subconscious thing. And actually, if, if we be, if we stay there, it becomes embodied right now. It's our, now it's our normal. And we can go through our whole life in a state of hyperventilation and never really accessing our parasympathetic calm, relaxed, rest, digest, feelings of contentment, contentedness, happiness, all comes from that parasympathetic nervous system. And the other thing we've kind of focused on the gut today, the parasympathetic nervous system is your vagus nerve, which is the 10th cranial nerve. And the vagus nerve innervates your gut. Um, it innervates, um, all the things that are running in the background, you know, it controls a lot of the heart rate, your blood pressure, your gut motility, um, all those things. So not only are you decreasing anxiety when you slow your breath, but you're also tapping that parasympathetic nervous system, um, which is brings a lot of other health um, related things as well. One thing that I'm seeing kind of leading into the breath epidemic levels of, I think I probably have 30 patients on my list are the iron deficiency. Um, my neighbor had had a lot of girl issues and had an endometrial ablation and all of that different stuff. And she still kept complaining of just the shortness of breath and I'm just exhausted. And I said, well, there's probably something wrong with your labs. And she's like, oh no, they checked that. My labs are normal. I'm like, well, she was going to go see a cardiologist and I'm like, but did they check your iron, your ferritin, like your storage, you know, your hemoglobin and matocrit, which carries the oxygen through your blood, just like you talked about, they may not be looking deep enough. So when we finally circled around and checked her ferritin, it was like a three. So no wonder she was short of breath. She thought she was having a heart attack, was headed to a cardiologist and goes back to nutrition. Why isn't our gut absorbing our iron and our nutrients? You know, so there's always obviously an answer if you keep digging, if you're not getting the answers from your, from your symptoms that your body's telling you, listen to your body. It, it usually knows and tells you the story and the chapter to look into. Mm -hmm. Love that. So um, sort of big picture related to COVID. And again, we won't consider any of this as medical advice, but what are, what are you all doing in your personal lives to keep yourself safe? What are you recommending to your patients as preventive measures? What, what, what advice can you give us there? I mean, I think, like I've said before, I think knowing your individual risk, I don't think there is a one size fits all for every individual person. I have a friend from college, her 19 year old contracted COVID. He was going to OU, recovered, did fine, but during that journey, discovered he had a blood clotting uh, disorder. And literally two or three weeks after his recovery from COVID, through a pulmonary embolism, had to be resuscitated and taken to ICU and ended up passing away. Oh. You know, I, nobody would have known that that he was a healthy 19 year old football player living his best life. And I think just knowing each individual your nutritional levels, you know, just getting your checkups and knowing your risks. Um, I don't think there is a one size fits all for every individual person. I mean, we can do the best we can, but eliminating stress and eating healthy, nutritionally dense foods, but COVID is definitely an interesting monster. Mm -hmm. yeah. And certainly, I mean, it's important to, in addition to eating healthy and drinking and all of that, remember that there are very simple ways to minimize your risk of contracting COVID. The first being, of course, wearing a mask, social distancing, washing your hands, wiping surfaces. These are things I, I joke with my patients and I was like, this is what you learned in kindergarten, right? <laughs> keep, your, keep your hands to yourself, <laughs> wash your hands. These are some very, very basic things. But with, with coronavirus, we know that this novel coronavirus, coronavirus is a bit new to us and possibly why children are not as sick with it is they get coronavirus other types all the time and get colds. So it's not new to the human race. It's not new in, in, of its, in and of itself, but this novel coronavirus is completely new to everyone. This pandemic is completely new. So I, I urge people to stay with very limited sources of information when it comes to what to do to stay safe and what to do to keep other people safe because there are 
experts in virology. They're experts in immune, your immune system. They're experts who have spent decades of their lives on this pre-pandemic who are now saying, here are the things you need to do to stay healthy and to keep others healthy. But what I'm finding a lot of my families are listening to are the people who have spent a day online reading who knows what sources and are now sharing that information on their social media pages. A day of work, I don't care how determined and, and committed you are, two weeks of work, six weeks of work of reading about this pandemic, even reading about it since it began, does not at any point give you the expertise that an immunologist has in terms of saying this is what you need to stay safe. I can't stress that enough. People come to me as a pediatrician and say, what would you do? And I say, if I'm deferring to a virologist and an immunologist and the CDC and experts, why, why do you feel it's okay for the random person to just spew information on social media and then follow that information? I find that very, very troubling. And it's also very concerning for me because my goal is always helping people get to healthy. And in order to help people get to healthy, you have to first start with validated and reputable and evidence-based sources, not opinions. Um, so I will, whenever people are asking my medical opinion, I will say, you will get my medical opinion, meaning as a medical expert, I will tell you what X and Y and Z is. I will not give you my opinion as another mom because that's just another opinion that you could have formed on your own. So you, your opinions of what to do next shouldn't come to, oh, well, you're also a mom and your son is in this high school. What would you do as a mom? I can give you factual information of what we've seen. And I can give you factual information on the ways to keep kids healthy and the ways to keep other children other than yourself, your child healthy. But beyond that, focus on, that's my big thing with COVID. If you want to keep yourself healthy during the pandemic, limit your sources to reputable sources, focus on the facts, and then bring it back to your family. I love Susan talking about making it personal. Bring it back to your family and what makes sense to your family. I had a, a, a a young couple come in a couple of days ago who asked me what they should do about daycare. Should this child go into daycare? And I gave them the facts around daycare. Daycares are probably, I don't know how they figured this out, but they've been one of the most successful in terms of keeping kids safe while they're in daycare. So the facts I could share with them, but in terms of the next step, which is their decision of whether or not to send their child to daycare, that's a personal decision that says, do we have the resources to do this? Can we keep her at home? Are there risk factors if she does contract COVID-19? Is that someone in the home who is an at-risk person where we don't even want to take that risk of her possibly contracting this virus? You have to really keep it personal and keep it specific to yourself because when you start thinking about all of Texas, all of Dallas, all of the school, all of the daycare, it, it, you're going to get 15 different stories that are anecdotal, not evidence-based, and that are probably fueled, unfortunately, by people's anxiety and their stress and their perspective of how things should be. So you're getting someone's personal agenda, not the facts that are going to help you make a good decision about your child. Um, so stick small sources, limited sources, evidence-based sources, validated sources, and always, always, always reach back to your doctor, your physician for any input in terms of medical advice on what to do next. Are there some specific sources that you like for the general public? So definitely the CDC. Um, CDC does stay updated. I know news sources often trump the CDC sometimes. So the Washington Post yesterday broke the news that the CDC was going to change the quarantine um, the quarantine time. I already got texts from all my mom, from friends who were asking the question, well, this, what does this mean? Will it no longer be 14 days? Um, and when you now go to the CDC website, you hear the real story, right? You're not hearing the news story that's meant to catch headlines, that's meant to be sensational and get people excited because they're selling a newspaper. What you're hearing is the true science behind it, which says the ideal is 14 days. However, understanding that there are specific um, economic factors, fam familial factors that are going to affect you being consistent for those 14 days here is the signs around why we chose 14 days. I love how they outlined this. They said, this is why we chose 14 days. This is the outer limit of how long it takes for you to still be contagious if you have this virus, whether or not you have symptoms. The reason we're now saying seven to 10 days is 
seven days if you have a negative test, and that negative test has to be two days before you stop your quarantine. That gives you as close to a limited chance of, of spreading that virus as possible, but we still want you to monitor yourself for the full 14 days because we know there's still a one to 3% chance of you spreading this virus, and if there's enough of a risk, you want to continue to monitor yourself. The 10 day says, I have no symptoms, I haven't tested, but it's been 10 days. And the CDC says, we understand economically those extra four days might be a hardship for you. Go ahead and break your quarantine. However, continue to monitor yourself for those remaining four days. Very different than Washington Post <laughs> and everyone else's newscast yesterday that made it seem like the CDC was no longer recommending 14 days. It's still 14 days. There are just certain situations, certain families in unique spaces that seven to 10 days might make more sense in these very specific ways. One of the sources I found that's actually a local, um, and you can probably help me, Amanda, I think you follow her too, it's the, your local epidemiologist. Uh, she is a Capel resident, from my understanding, and just posts facts about, you know, viruses and statistics and those sorts of things. I found her stuff pretty interesting as well. Because it is hard to, even as a healthcare provider, to filter through the craziness. I mean, everybody comes in with the news said this, my grandma said that, you know, everybody has a hot sports opinion. So I think to just, you know, listening to their fears and their concerns, but you have to do what your family is comfortable with. You know, if you don't want to participate in the upcoming uh, Christmas holiday with your family, you, know, you have to make that decision and be okay with that. And respect that decision because there is not one answer we're all learning it's we haven't had a pandemic for over 100 years and you know you would think we would have health care and wellness and all this figured out but we don't there's still so much to learn i'll drop a link for her facebook page and actually i think leanne loop is the one that introduced me to her and yes she is a local Coppell mom mm -hmm. Dr. Javaji, Amy, anything that you all would add to that? So I think with um, COVID, I think you're right. You definitely go to the sources. Don't take, um, don't take social media and, and whatever uh, headlines, catchy headlines or clickbaits um, as, uh, as what's going on with the world and, and then running with it. Um, and another thing I know people have asked me and they've asked me so many times is about the vaccine that's coming out and is the vaccine going to work and would you take it and all that. And I mean, honestly, I, I don't know at this point because we don't we don't know about the vaccine. Like with the flu vaccine, there's been years of years of studies and we followed so many people um, that have gotten the flu vaccine. And then there's been so much um, research done and evidence based uh, on that vaccine. and. Yes, I know we're in a race for a vaccine and everyone's trying it and I'm sure they're not gonna push out something that's super dangerous. But at the same time, everything that they're saying is a very small sample size. It's, it's not, um, you have to think about the sample size when you do look at this information about vaccines because you know, with the flu vaccine, they've done it on millions. And when it comes to the COVID vaccine, they've done it on like what, 46,000? And the Oxford vaccine was like what, 2,500? Like it wasn't, it wasn't that many and you know that's you're still in in this stage yes you might be protecting yourself but you're still kind of in the guinea pig phase because you know you're still we don't know years from now because we didn't COVID-19 has not been around for years and um but now like with this vaccine I would say just definitely go to the sources before you you know just go ahead and tote about the vaccine and, and go hunt for the vaccine and just Make sure you got your um, sources right, and uh, and for me, I even have my doubts about whether I would take it, uh, even though it's offered to healthcare workers first, or, or they might, you know, offer it to um, health professionals first. But I, I still have my reservations with it, and um, and uh, even though Dr. Fauci said he would take it, um, and I do trust him because, uh, like you know, uh, Dr. Amanda said, it's it's. Uh, it, it, he's a very reputable person that's worked with a you know the AIDS epidemic and and all of that and he's been on many task force um, 
but at the same time, when it comes to something like that in the future of where this is going, the best way is to still continue what we know, uh, what we've been knowing for the past few months is just well, hand washing, social distancing, and you know, making the right decisions for you. And you know, that story that, uh, that um, Susan was talking about too, about you know, the young boy that, that passed away suddenly. And there's no way of knowing if you're the person that has a blood clotting issue. You, it, it's, a, it's a gamble at the end of the day. You're gambling with the idea that, you know, do you have a clotting issue? And we don't even know what clotting issue it is to look for either, because as, as doctors, we don't know enough about it. So, um, you know, are you willing to gamble? Like, yes, you might not get anything, but at the same time, is it one of your family members might have it? And you're seeing that in general with COVID too, you're seeing family members, um, multiple family members getting the severity of the, uh, disease, the disease too. Um, you know, a mom gets it and her daughter gets it and they, they share the same kind of genetic gene pool and they're getting the severity of it too as well. Um, and, you know, there's so many, there's so much that's unknown about this that uh, I guess going back to the basics and going back to the sources and, kind of going back to what we learned in kindergarten is the best way to stay safe. And yes, the vaccine is hopeful, but I wouldn't put all your eggs in on the vaccine and think that it's going to be our save all because uh, I still have my doubts with it and I'm going to until millions of people have had it and we know a little bit more about it uh, just because of the sample size, it's just pure numbers at this point. Amanda wanted to quickly mention, I put in the chat box um, a great local resource, Texas Medical Association. Um, so they have our um, Dallas County, um, or actually all of the county health department epidemiologists have come together and have put some great resources on the TMA website. Um, one of them they've done since the pandemic started is the risk level. So they've now created a holiday one, which of these activities is the lowest risk over the holidays and which is the highest risk. So I put those two links in the chat for everyone. Thank you. Thank you. So one last question. I know all four of you have got to be exhausted. You've been seeing patients through all of this and managing your personal lives. But every time I see you, you all have smiles on your faces. So um, what, what, what makes you smile every day? I'll, I'll go. Um, I, it, this year has been such an interesting year uh, for everybody. Um, and it, it's been so different for everybody, right? Everybody's, we've had these, this shared experience, um, but everyone's experience has been a little bit different. Um, and, but I, and, it, and it's been tough. Like uh, we celebrated 20 years in February, uh, 20 years in business. And I did not imagine <laughs> that I would be uh, doing what I've had, what I've had to do this year. Uh, so it's, it's been tough. Um, but I would say that I also have a renewed sense of um, purpose. Um, I feel like what we do um, all day long, every day at the clinic is, is, is more important now than ever before. Um, it, just if we can keep someone that has low back pain out of the emergency room to um, take off the stress of our already stressed healthcare system, um, if we can help someone with their anxiety, um, you know, and all the repercussions from that. Uh, so for me, it, yes, it's been tough, but it, it, there's a renewed sense of um, what we do is important. And so that's what, that's what keeps me coming back every day with a smile and um, trying to stay focused on that. Yeah, for me, mine is sort of similar. I mean, I think it's just listening and being a sounding board to each patient, friend, family member, um, being respectful of their opinions and decisions. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's been a lot of political craziness and racial craziness and healthcare craziness. And I think just loving everyone and being, you know, respectful of each individual's hot sports opinions because we all have them. Um, and for me, what really brings me joy every day is just being able to find the root of someone's issue and optimizing their health, making them feel their best that they can despite their circumstances, because we all have COVID-19 circumstances that are uncontrollable. So I think just doing the best that we can with the information that we have today and just taking one step forward every single day. 
Um, so I would say smiling is part of my mental health therapy. <laughs> when you smile, especially if you smile in front of a mirror, it changes your mood. You will be amazed. Um, I think it's, it's to any point, it slows down your breathing. It gives you a moment to think things through. So the next time you're upset at someone or feeling bad, get a mirror, put the mirror, <laughs> and then respond. But yeah, it's, it really is part of my just getting myself in the right headspace. Um, I think for, for everyone. So I started my practice right before the pandemic. I started in November um, and then the pandemic hit and I joke around and say that I planned it. I meant for it to be <laughs> pandemic year. Um, so it's been a very challenging first year in practice, but at the same time, we've, we've reached a lot of families. I've been able to do what I love every single day. So it, it feels like it, it was stressful, but it went by so quickly. Um, that we've already celebrated our one year anniversary. And um, just being able to have that family connection with my parents, with my siblings, with my son, those things really helped to, to energize me. And of course, two months ago, some people know, most people don't, I got engaged. So, yeah. <laughs> so that was very exciting for me. <laughs> so my fiance as well. <laughs> but yeah, so it's it's been a it's been a mixed year. I agree. It's been a mixed year, but mostly positive on the personal end. One other thing I wanted to add, I did have um, really my heart just broke for this patient. She was an elderly patient and she no one has checked on her. Like she doesn't have any family. She lives alone and she came here and just literally cried. And she was like, I'm moving. I'm moving to like a retirement center. She said, because, you know, everybody says check on everybody, but no one's checked on me. And I think it just made me more aware, like, wow, who haven't I checked on? What elderly neighbors or family members, you know, we have been very isolated. And if they're not into technology, they're going to even be more isolated. So I think just sending a simple text or making that extra phone call to you know, are you okay? I'm running to the grocery store. Do you need me to get anything for you? Just little simple acts of kindness to make sure that no one is feels forgotten because it's really been easy to have those feelings this year. Congratulations, Amanda. That great news. And yes, you're absolutely right about checking um, checking in on people. I get that. I get that so often, especially with the elderly community and. Um, and, and it's just, there's a lot of, uh, people that are isolated and they're not doing their daily things. And, um, the pandemic has made that 10 times harder. And it's when you can add a little, um, I guess a little smile to their face or just at the end of the day, we're all detectives too. And, uh, getting to the root of, um, as you were saying, Susan, about, um, why they're getting this and then making that little difference that they've been struggling with and helping them find that, you know, uh, the light at the end of the tunnel or just some sort of answer to why they've been experiencing it. And it's not just in their head. Um, it, it really puts a smile on my face because I, I feel like as uh, healthcare professionals, we, we went into this industry in order to help people. And uh, I guess that's, and doing that on a daily basis, obviously, uh, why why won't you be happy about that <laughs> and i and i think the smile just comes naturally when it when you do what you love and i think everyone here <laughs> can stay true to that because it all looks like we love what we do um and uh yeah the the pandemic definitely has its silver linings and everything too and i completely agree i started this practice in august and of 2019 and i was full blown pregnant and and then i was on maternity leave and then covid hit and so I'm like, you know, you just, you just go with it <laughs> and uh, you just take it for what it is. And there's always a silver lining with everything and you just have to find it. And I would, I'd like to give a shout out to um, the couple chamber, to Ellie and her team um, and to Amanda and her team and to the city of Capel. I have felt so supported as a small business owner, um, just, I have just felt so supported from everybody. Um, and I'm, I've just, I'm so thankful to be a part of this community. Um, you know, Amanda's offered to help me, you know, just pro bono, what can I help you with, with some things? Um, 
and um, Ellie and her team, just the way they they handled the the uh, pandemic, it was like Ellie was the right in the right place at the right time or the right person. Um, and just her team and then the city. And so I just, I, I'm very, I feel very lucky to have benefited from that and just want to give a shout out to, to uh, everybody. So thank you. Thanks, Amy. We're, we're lucky to have you in the community. So Corey Stoller, I would like to at this point hand it over to you. Corey is with DFW Airport who has been kind enough to sponsor our event and make this possible. So, Corey? Thank you, Amanda. Um, I'll be really brief because I know we're coming up on time. Um, what an amazing group of women. I have learned so much today. I'm, I've been taking notes and I'm really excited to put some of these things into use. So thank you uh, to our, our panelists. Um, I'm Corey Stoller. I'm the Communications and Marketing Manager at DFW and also a Coppell Chamber Board member. Uh, on behalf of the airport, I'd like to thank Ellie and Layla and the team at the chamber for hosting today's event. It's, it's been fantastic. And I've been to several of them. And so far, this one is really high up there, if not my absolute favorite. Um, at DFW, we are committed to providing world-class customers you know, experience, not only for the passengers, but also for our business partners. Um, we are an international airport, and it's easy to think kind of on a global scale for us, but it's also important to uh, not forget who, who plays a pivotal role in what happens here close to home. We are super proud to be part of the partnership with the Coppell Chamber, and we recognize that we play a big role in developing business opportunities in this community. We also recognize that our success would not be possible at all without our employees. And so we continue to invest in programs that promote the growth and development of the employees. Um, we have a diversity, equity, and inclusion program within the organization that is amazing. And we are consistently ranked one of the healthiest employers in North Texas for our Live Well program. Um, we get, it's a free workout space. We get shots. It's, an, it's amazing. Um, which is another reason we're really proud to support today's event and the esteemed panel that we've heard from. Thank you. I just want to say thank you to everyone for, you know, being alongside us on this journey through, through this pandemic and to safely connect our community to the world. I think we, we definitely together make an impact in the local business community as well as the region. Thanks, thank Corey. You. We thank so appreciate you. you. Yes, thank you. And then our program sponsor is Mr. Cooper. Ellie, were you going to say something on behalf of Mr. Cooper? Um, yes, I'm Ellie Braxton. I'm the president and CEO of the Coppell Chamber of Commerce. And I want to thank you, Amy, first for those kind words. Um, we uh, we uh, felt that we really rose to the occasion during that and, and actually did what you guys have been hiring us for for all these years. So um, anyway, thank you so much for that. And um, Sneeza Carnes was on with us earlier, but she had to uh, sign off because she had another meeting that she is with Mr. Cooper. And Mr. Cooper, for those of you that don't know, um, is a mortgage company. Um, they actually handle your mortgages and, um, and they're huge over here in Cypress Waters. Um, they are a huge supporter of ours. Uh, we're very, very grateful to them. And um, you, um, if you're looking for a mortgage or you need to refi, be sure to contact us and we can connect you with Mr. Cooper. So thank you to them because they sponsor it for the entire year. Um, and thank you to DFW um, for sponsoring our women's panel for this, uh, for this event. Um, we're very, very grateful for that. So thank you. And I want to personally say one more final thanks to the sponsors. Um, I don't know if everybody knows this or not, but December is insane for healthcare providers. So the fact that these four women carved out um, time today is a huge sacrifice and so incredibly appreciated. Tony, I am gonna let you close this up and wrap us, wrap us out. Terrific, thank you so much. So um, yeah, I, I obviously I want to thank um, DFW Airport and uh, Mr. Cooper uh, for their sponsorship. We couldn't do this without you. Uh, and so we so appreciate that. 
Um, again, I have to thank the amazing Amanda with the Brummett Group and her staff. This event, it's my favorite event, and we're gonna continue doing this. This is our third year, so sorry, Amanda, you can run, but you can't hide. We'll keep it up. And just thank you to your, you and your amazing team. Um, our panelists, um, I know how busy all of y'all are, and I, and I love what uh, one of you said, you said, that we love what you do. And it's obvious that all four of you wonderful women love what you do. And by the way, you're darn good at it. And we are honored that you would give up your time and share your talent with us. I have learned so much today. I too, Corey, took notes and I, I'm gonna bombard my husband when he gets back. So, um, and then our amazing staff, Amy, you said it better than I can say it. Um, Ellie and Layla have been amazing. And Ellie has led this charge. She has helped save businesses. Layla too. Um, I am so proud. I'm gonna get emotional. I am so proud of our chamber. They're an incredible organization. They have done a, big, a great job and will continue to do so. And so <clears throat> I will uh, take a little credit for being the chairman of the board when Ellie was hired. So, um, <laughs> Anyway, love you all. thank you so much. And uh, that's it. It's a wrap, guys. Thank Thanks. You. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you, everybody. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thank you to all of you. It was wonderful. Yes, I went and drank like three glasses of water while y'all were talking. <laughs> <laughs> I got a run. I've had my whole life streams bottle today. So I, I got to go. Love y'all. Bye. All right. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye.